Funding for the art show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, the Virginia W. Kettering Foundation, proud supporter of the arts in our community, and viewers like you. Thank you. In this edition of the art show, exclusive behind the scene footage of a new Dayton music video. We waited a long time just to get that shot. See how the purchase of a smartphone changed one environmental scientist's perspective. Almost all of my images are two, three, four, five images combined into one. And if these walls could talk, they'd speak loudly. And murals were used as a tool. And because they're narrative, they spoke out. It's all ahead on this edition of The Art Show. Hello, I'm Rodney Veal and this is The Art Show, where each week we give you unprecedented access to local, regional, and national artists and arts organizations. Last year, a group of committed Dayton artists released a music video that became a YouTube sensation. Director-producer David Sherman and producer-songwriter Sandy Bashar are back this year with a sequel piece titled Where the Rivers Meet. Welcome, you guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Rodney. For, for our viewers, um, could you kind of give them a little bit of a background of, of how this came to be. Sure. Um, well, we sort of met last year um, and City Folk asked us to create a music video for the city um, and the result was Where There Is Love, uh, a multicultural uh, piece which brought together over 14 musicians from across Dayton and uh, it's now been seen by over 300,000 people. So this new video What's different about it from the first video? What makes it so unique from the first one? Well, the song uh, is an original song this time. Well, I guess the last one was more or less original, but um, uh, I wrote the song this time. And uh, for, for this song, I really wanted to include the notion of Welcome Dayton and um, our immigrant-friendly initiative that we have here in Dayton. And so I used a, the river as a metaphor for people coming together uh, in the same place. And I'm, and I'm sure bringing that, using the metaphor of the river, that probably brought in some really exciting locations. Can you want to talk about like some of the locations that, oh that people will see in the video? Yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of time is spent finding those locations because you know, they are just as much a character in the final piece as the musicians and dancers. And um, you know, among them, we looked at old canals. We, we sort of tried to tie the water element into into the uh, locations. And uh, so we, we had the brilliant idea to shoot on water. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that provided some challenges. Right, right, to itself. put one of our, our musicians actually on a boat on water and um, in front of a really beautiful sculpture called Fluid Dynamics, um, just downtown, it's brand new. Um, Eastwood Park. Eastwood Park. Um, Metro Parks was incredibly helpful. And shooting on the river, I'm sure, provided some challenges, but what about the weather, like this whole process of filming outdoors? I mean, I think a lot of us don't really know that how complicated that might be. Right. I mean, this, this style is more documentary than anything. We're actually performing, uh, I'm sorry, we're actually capturing musicians live as they're playing in the moment. Right. And um, so with that, of course, we have to deal with the elements. So um, a few times the weather was such that we had to wait it out. The rain, um, you in particular, when All we right. filmed you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our, our viewers are going to see the fact that I'm you know, the, the host, but also they see me in another capacity as a dancer. So and I'm right. excited about that. An incredibly accommodating artist. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. that was the scheduling. Uh, oh, the scheduling yeah. thing, so we had to wait for the right kind of light. Right. We wanted you in perfect silhouette. For silhouette, and, we'll, and later on in the interview, we'll talk about that sure. because it's it was such so much fun to do. But to answer your question, of yeah. course, yeah, I mean, you have to deal with a lot of of elements, including the weather, including crowds, you know, mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes you may end up. I mean, you end up with what you get. So, did you expand the number of performers that actually performed in this music video versus the first one? So yes. Did it, so okay. did it kind of grow I, in that? Capacity? Yeah, I think we we. I think we had more dancers this right. time, maybe. Yeah, okay. right. uh -huh. yeah, in our last video, we featured um, some Tai Chi dancers, which uh, sort of got a lot of attention. And um, 
And we decided that, you know, dancers were just as important as musicians in our community, and so we wanted to really showcase them. So you'll see a lot more dancers in this video. I know uh, you just showed me a, a clip from the uh, music video, and there's a fantastic shot of the train with the musician. And can you talk about that for a little bit? Well, <laughs> We waited a long time just to get that shot. Um, of course, we had to get permission, and so we had um, our, our fiddler, uh, Dan Gellert, uh, waiting, waiting anxiously for a train to appear. Um, we waited for several hours, and of course, we had to move on to our next performance. We just packed up, and you know, here comes the train. We did manage to get that train. We, we won't tell you how. It's a little bit of a, uh, a secret. The, the, magic of, the magic of cinema and right, patience right, and right, perseverance. Right. I think exactly. that's okay. Are there any changes and differences in like, you know, you film on land and you just wear static shots, but are there some difficulties in filming things involving water? I mean, how, how hard is that? Well, the, um, the, the artist that he was talking about that was in a boat, Jose Rios, I was playing a uh, whose name, by the way, whose last name is River. River. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how appropriate! Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was David wanted to film him in a boat, so he was in a canoe, and uh, sitting in the end of the canoe, you know, with the photographer and and Michael running the the uh, recorder and a little trolling motor, and it, I mean, it was crazy. And only after this whole thing was over with, and, and they did quite a few passes, so it was some hours on the river. Okay. Only afterwards, his Jose's wife uh, told us that Jose was a little nervous about water, and he didn't swim very well. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, your, so your performer... But yeah, he, no, he, he, was, didn't, he didn't, he didn't let on at all. He was yeah. such a That's trooper. so great. I can't wait to and see And, it, you know, the boat was rocking, okay. so it's, it's not easy to, f you know, focus. He's hearing the music in headphones. He's, he's playing the guitar to the music, and, and the boat is kind of going like this, you know. Wow. It was, it was an interesting thing, but it, it looks beautiful, though. At the, in the end of it, it looks gorgeous. Right. Cool. And, and again, that was all captured live. That's a live performance right. on a boat. So. And so that's what I think this was really cool about. And also too, speaking from a performance standpoint, there was a moment because I'm, I'm dancing in the fountain at Rivers, inter interactive fountain at Riverscape. There is a fantastic um, use of aerial photography and cinematography. So you want to talk a little bit about like this idea of doing something a little different? Um, this video is different in that we wanted to sort of raise the stakes and um, show a perspective of Dayton that not a lot of people see. Um, and shooting the rivers, of course, it's, it's cooler to see them from up above. Yeah. So we actually uh, hired this great crew uh, called Perfect Perspectives, which is a local aerial photography company. And they did some amazing work um, shooting the rivers, shooting some of our performers from up above. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we, we, we got some great, great shots. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to show the video. And I had a, pr it was a privilege and an honor to, to dance in the water for oh you guys. So that was great. So <laughs> we were honored to have you. That was great. So let's take a look. Where the rivers meet.
Are you an artist or know an artist with an interesting story? Pitch it to us. Send an email to theartshow at thinktv.org. Include contact information and links to performances or art samples online. Amy Librand started to seriously pursue photography after purchasing her smartphone in 2009. Since then, she has become a leader in the global mobile photography movement. Her work continues to evolve, and she currently incorporates her atmospheric images onto interactive wood constructs that beckon viewers to physically engage with her art pieces. Standalone Productions. Yo, check it, yo, check it. Where do I go from here? Somebody please tell me. I work as a researcher for a large uh, research and development nonprofit here in Columbus, um, mostly for government contracts dealing with um, the environment and public health. I really started doing self-portraiture just to have um, images to put on <laughs> Facebook <laughs> for profile photos, and and they just and then I just ran with it. I mean, people had a good reaction to them, and I started getting a little more experimental with them. And um, the iPhone was was just a way for me to always be able to produce something, always be able to experiment, no matter where I was, no matter what I was doing. Whereas you know, with the DSLR, you're lugging around a big kit. So with my iPhone, I, I do, I just point and click. Sometimes I will set things up. I do have a little tripod system. Um, and that's where some of my, my more conceptual work comes from is there's definitely a thought process there. Um, I would describe myself as um, an image manipulator. I don't consider myself a photographer um, because most of what I do is, is after I take a shot. The post-production for mobile photography is pretty complex with my work. Um, almost all of my images are two, three, four, five images combined into one. Um, I do a lot of uh, superimposing. You know, for the most part, I try to do as much as I can in the field, so to speak. Um, so sometimes I'll put like, a, you know, I'll, I'll shoot through the bottom of a glass or I'll put, um, pantyhose on top of the lens or something like that to give it more realistic uh, atmosphere versus just applying a filter. Though I do use a lot of apps. <laughs> My work has evolved quite a bit this past year. I was exploring new ways to display my artwork and um, one of the things I've been doing lately um, is transferring images onto wood. Um, and then that developed into um, taking scrap wood and creating these mechanical interactive pieces where um, you inv I'm, I'm inviting the viewer to touch them, to play with them, to maybe pull on something to reveal a hidden image. If you really look at my work, if you know my work, it, it, it's actually a pretty straightforward evolution. Um, my images themselves invite the viewer to interact with them just because they're kind of, they're narrative and they're storytelling and everybody who looks at my work gets something completely different out of them. For example, I have an image I recently did where um, it was shot from the floor and you just see feet dangling over the floor. And I've heard everything from she's hanging to she's jumping for joy to she's floating to she's, you know, disappearing to, and people have always interacted with my work in that way so to move on to actually physically interacting with my work seemed like a logical progression for me. I have very vivid dreams and I keep a notebook um, beside my bed and every night before I go to bed I get on Pinterest for about 10 or 15 minutes and the inspiration just comes from everywhere. It could be a picture of a forest. It could be, um, I don't know, a, a donut. It could be anything. When I look at Pinterest and, and get that inspiration right before bedtime, then I tend to dream a little bit more. And then when I wake up in the morning, I sometimes have a concrete idea of what I want to do. I am not making art every day. I wish I was making art every day. But the inspiration comes and goes. Um, I'm, t I'm shooting photographs every day. Now whether I do anything with them or not is a whole other story. 
people are always surprised when they learn that I'm in the sciences and not in, <laughs> in the arts. I have so many ideas. I don't even know what's next. It's just whatever hits me at the moment. <laughs> Somebody please tell me what now. Despite the amount of times I've been locked down, my feet keep trotting on somehow. See a schedule of her exhibits and speaking engagements in and around Columbus at thisspaceisrented.com. Finally, tonight, join us as we walk the halls of Texas Southern University in Houston. For more than 60 years, its walls have served as the canvas of expressive students. And today, lined with over 100 murals, they're dripping with American history. Mural painting has been a required course on the Texas Southern University's campus since the inception of the art program. There are approximately 128 murals on the campus. Texas Southern University was founded in 1947. It was already an existing institution that became Texas State College for Negroes. Now we know it as Texas Southern University. Dr. Biggers was brought to Texas Southern University in the spring of 1948. He was already established as a muralist working at Penn State, and he had heard so much about Texas. So he pretty much enjoyed uh, the South here and saw it as an opportunity to begin to tell the story of art and the community because he saw it as a rich, vast territory. This building was the second building on the campus and the art program was housed on the third floor. One of the first things they did was to begin painting murals. All these murals are by students. Many of the early students were former military recruits who had come here. So some of the first murals done in the early 50s uh, show some of that experience. You'll see the importance of becoming successful and that success pretty much tied to education. You'll see reflections of the rural south, so you'll see cotton and other parts of the trade. As you move into the 60s and the civil rights movement begins to heat up, you begin to see some of the important figures of that civil rights struggle, including the presidents and uh, Martin Luther King. As you get into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, you'll see a change in color. The temperature is much warmer, hotter. You'll still see some of the earlier concepts of survival, of moving forward, of the importance of education. Religion is also very strong in these works. Herman Oliver has two full murals as well as a few little vignettes. So he was quite prolific. You'll also see the murals of Jesse Cifuentes. I came to Texas Southern uh, in 1973 and uh, the 70s was a different era. Well, the instruction was you have to paint a narrative. It has to tell a story. My mural is in a geometric form instead of the naturalistic representation. So it shows a family together. As it shows a young family, and it shows also some grandparents. They're, they're seniors, they have white hair, and they got grandchildren. When I see the murals now, I think about a history. It shows a legacy. It shows, uh, it tells a story also. They, each mural will give uh, a different narrative of the time they were, they were being painted. My name is John Bullock, and I graduated in 2008. Well, it's titled, They Shall Be Filled. So I just really wanted to figure out a way visually to tie in the Old and the New Testament, as well as having Jesus as this centerpiece in the uh, communion. It definitely is a rigorous process, but you gotta really figure out how to tie all the pieces together. So the biggest part for me was to spatially represent, you know, this storyline. 
and have something that people can kind of walk through and see, you know, a narrative. And I actually intentionally used some of the same color palette uh, from that mural and my mural uh, so they wouldn't compete too much and really um, work in harmony. I used to take breaks when I first started uh, with just a bare white wall and a grid and um, kind of look at that mural just to kind of uh, figure out kind of how they got to their end point and visualize how we get to mine. So it you know, was a huge inspiration just to be right next to it. Over the years that Dr. Biggers spent at Texas Southern, he developed quite a career for himself as well as having motivated a number of students. Before his retirement, he did the large mural, which we think is his crowning jewel, in the Sterling Student Center. It's a wonderful large mural called Family Unity that reflects his change in style as well as his interest in the African diaspora. I would say that we have quite a unique experience on this campus where you're surrounded by works that tell stories and give you the history, but do so in a beautiful, quiet way. People can learn so much from the murals, and they have appreciated them over the decades. The murals here at Texas Southern, I think, are treasures. As a pen is to a writer, the brush is to a muralist. And murals were used as a tool. And because they're narrative, they spoke out. So I think that it gave the artist a voice. I think there's only a few people that can really say they're a part of a legacy of over 50 years. To be a part of this, it's a huge honor. This is a, a gem in the city of Houston and actually in, in the country. There's not too many places like this. Visit any of our local college campuses to see a variety of unique student work. And that wraps it up for this edition of The Art Show. Take time out of your schedule to see some fantastic, amazing art. Until next time, I'm Rodney Veal, and thanks for watching. Funding for the Art Show was made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, the Virginia W. Kettering Foundation, proud supporter of the arts in our community, Ohio Arts Council, Ohio Humanities Council, and viewers like you. Thank you.